Hello. Hopefully you can hear and see me. My name is Tomo Nakahara. I'm the head of the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And today we are very lucky to have Ray Sang from Google as our guest speaker. He'll be talking about debugging and troubleshooting microservices in Kubernetes. Um, and we also have Carlos Leon from Container Solutions, who is kind of an extension of our developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And he'll be talking about monitoring microservices based on some of the work that he's done. But first, a word from our sponsor, <laughs> Weaveworks. Um, if you haven't heard of us, um, we are from the creators of RabbitMQ. Both our CEO and CTO um, are the ones who created and then sold off RabbitMQ. We're also a Google Ventures company, and we are headquartered in London with offices in San Francisco and Berlin, as well as engineers around the world. Our main product is Weave Cloud, which is a SaaS product that helps you with observability and management and monitoring of your container clusters, as well as has other capabilities such as networking and um, continuous delivery. So this is one of the cool features that we have in Weave Cloud. As you can see, you have great observability through processes, containers, pods, and hosts. And one of the cool things, you can even drill down onto an individual pod and even cooler, using this CLI tool that we have, you can look right into the pod, um, in this case, to gather information, in other cases, to make changes as well. So if you like more information, yes, please go to weave.works. Um, and of course, we are hiring. So find out more and come chat with us. So with that, I will hand it over to Ray. All righty. So uh, thanks again for having me on the Weave Online uh, Meetup here. And uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I'm part of the engineering group, but uh, I love to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that we have to offer, either on the platform or in open source. And I love to hear about your feedback and uh, your experiences with our projects. So if you have any questions, any feedback, um, any comments, please, please reach out to me on Twitter at Salmonism. I don't have a lot of time today, but um, so I'm going to walk through some of the, the key uh, things that you can actually do in Kubernetes that helps you uh, debug or troubleshoot uh, your applications that's running inside. So to demonstrate this, I have a little application here. Uh, it's a the best looking application I can write. It's a black and white uh, a bootstrap app, app, right? It's very, very simple and straightforward. It's got a little guest book that's built in so you can type your name and message or story. And then behind the scenes is also close another service, the Hello World service that says hello to you. So this is literally two of the best demo applications put together. And um, behind the scenes, this is the high level architecture. We have the front end, we got two microservices running behind the scenes. Oh, by the way, just to say hi to people. Uh, and then we have Redis for session replication or session store. We got a MySQL database for storing data. Uh, so let's take a look at it. Uh, Oh, 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 that's not good. I hope that's not happening again. But I'm going to go to my visualization tool here. And you can see that I'm running this inside of Kubernetes. I'm running this um, Google Container Engine, which is the managed Kubernetes service on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, very easy to set one up. And I have five nodes. I just have to say I need five VMs, and it will give me five. And then I can start deploying my entire application stack into it. And as you can see, we have the front end uh, that has two. Instances running two pods. Um, I have my guest book service running there. I got MySQL and everything else. So let's take a look at the uh, the app very quickly. Uh, so hopefully that will work. Oh, no. Well, I hmm. I actually tried to uh, try to debug this uh, problem earlier to make sure it works, but I think uh, we still have an issue. So uh, thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so let's see what's going on here. So this is talking about internal server error. I have no idea what that means uh, for, for not null. How do you get two status messages, you know, two HTTP status errors in a single message? I have no idea. So what is going on here? What do we typically do to troubleshoot this? Well, um, I have worked as a consultant for a very long time for Fortune 500 companies, and um, I have to deal with a lot of the uncles and production troubleshooting. And one of the first things that I typically do is to you know, potentially see if this is working in another environment. 
I don't know what the user has done, but you just want to make sure this app still works. So I, I test it out potentially in a different uh, browser, I, you know, with a session, or I go to my staging environment. And of course, in Kubernetes, uh, we can actually carve out the, the cluster into different namespaces. In this case, I have a special namespace for staging. So I can just go ahead and see uh, what is running in the staging environment. And I can get my uh, IP here to take a look to see if the application is working. Uh, it works. Hello there. Uh, and OK, that's kind of nice. So it works in staging. But of course, it works in staging. I mean, why would you ever push something to production if it didn't work in staging? But how do we know they are running the same application? Well, that's another uh, little thing that we should check, right? Are they actually running exactly the same container images? And the way that we can potentially see is to see what YAML files we have deployed with Kubernetes. Uh, but to get the accurate state, what we really need to do is to uh, dig in uh, into the real-time information and for that, I can do something like kubectl describe the pod. And as we scroll up a little bit, I can see the environment of variables I've set up. That looks right. Um, my health check is working. That's fine. And then I can see the container ID and the image. And I think one of the first issue here is I'm using the latest version. But what does that actually mean, latest? Well, first of all, you should never do this. Never run a latest tag in your production environment because you don't know what latest is. It could be latest from yesterday. It could be latest from today. No idea. But uh, what we need to check is the, the SHA, uh, basically. Um, and if you're using something to store your container images, something like Artifactory, for example, what you can potentially do is to copy and paste the SHA. And you can do a little search. And then you should be able to be able to find like where that image came from. So for example, if this job matches the, the latest image here for Hello World, um, but what does that actually mean? Well, in Artifactory or in some comparable systems, what you can figure out is the latest version is actually revision number 50. But then what's actually inside of this container is another question. And again, in, in some of these tools like Artifactory, what you can actually do is to tie up this entire uh, artifact end to end, you can actually understand, for example, what is in the container, uh, how was this container built. So if you're building this from a Jenkins pipeline, you can go back to the Jenkins build as well. Uh, or I can dig in into this build and actually see uh, what is actually inside. I can see the published modules. I can see that this includes the Hollow World UI uh, jar. And I can dig in even deeper to see all the dependencies to make sure that everything that's running in my prod is what I should be running. And of course, snapshot is not something I should be doing, but this is just a demo. But to be sure that this is the same version in staging, what we really need to do is to also get to that staging namespace, oh, staging. And, um, and we can use kubectl uh, describe the pod and just make sure that they are the same hash. And I'm pretty sure they are the same hash. They both ended with the FD3C. So they are exactly the same app. So that is too bad. Uh, so for some reason, uh, this app is not working. Then what do we do? Well, typically, uh, the best source to get more info is to see the logs. Uh, Kubernetes makes it really easy uh, to get the logs from your instances as well, uh, especially for those of you who hasn't been using Kubernetes. And you know, I've done this talk uh, a bit with people who only use Docker. In Docker, you have something like Docker log, where you can see all the log messages. Well, in Kubernetes, right, I can actually see, do something like kubectl logs, and I can give it the name of the instance I'm trying to take a look at, and I should be able to see all the logs uh, I can tell them. Now, given that we only have two instances, what are the chances for me to find the log message in the right instance? Uh, that's about 50-50, assuming that this error only occurred in one of these instances. But if you have like 10 or 20 microservices or instances running, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to find the right instance actually has an error. Or maybe you're lucky. Maybe, maybe this is a broader problem where it's occurring in every running instance. But sometimes, sometimes it, the error could just be affecting one of these instances and you really need to know which one, right? So I got lucky here, 50-50 chance. I got to find the instance that has my error. Then I can debug it. I can troubleshoot it somehow. But if you don't know, or if you have too many instances running, 
what I used to do was to, uh, this is a long time ago, right? I had to SSH into the remote machine. I have to download all the logs, uh, aggregate them together. I need to run a Perl script to do a little uh, regex expression to find the things I want to find and then maybe gather a little statistics to figure out whether the error is only running uh, happening in one instance or a group of instances or whatever. Uh, so that was all manual process, but luckily with Kubernetes now, uh, as long as you're outputting your log in your STD out or STD error stream, uh, typically you can install a centralized logger agent that will then aggregate and propagate all the logs into a single location. Uh, whether you're using open source like the ELK stack that you can provision directly in Kubernetes, or maybe use some other toolings from other vendors that can aggregate this log for you. Um, and that is going to be a lot useful when you're running in microservices because you need ways to gather all of your logs uh, across all of your instances. And so, for example, on Google Cloud, uh, we have direct integration into stack driver logging. And with that, I can actually drill in into the cluster. I got two clusters here. I can drill in into the namespace I want to see. And furthermore, I can you know, take a look at specifically the application that I want to take a look at for the logs. And here I can see, oh, I got lots of these arrows. Maybe I'm not the only one using this. <laughs> and you can, of course, search and do all that things. You can set up alerting on these arrow messages if you want. But one of the, the, the interesting thing for me is to actually be able to export these logs. And I can actually export it uh, into something like BigQuery, which is a way for us to query a lot of data uh, unstructured data, well, you need columns and stuff, but you can do a lot of interesting queries against uh, terabytes or you know petabytes of data, uh, especially when it comes to log, where you do have a lot of logs. Uh, this is a really good way to get more insight. So for example, uh, I have already exported this, um, this, this log into BigQuery, and I can actually construct a SQL query. This is a standard SQL query, uh, where I can actually count the occurrences of the errors. Uh, in my application, I can count it for just today, for example, to, for uh, September 26th. I can restrict it to the resource type of containers. I'm looking for a keyword like exceptions. I'm going to group by the name and it's going to order by the occurrences to see which instance happens the most. I can run this query. Um, oh, did I miss uh, one of the, the things here? Uh oh, what happened here? So let me result fails. Hold on a second. Oh no. Let me go back to my query history. Uh, take another one here. I'm going to open the query. There we go. And let me try to run this query again. Yeah, no. Good. That's better. And it's pretty even. But I can also look at for the entire lifespan, or I can do a time range if I want to. So in this case, I think I can do a star. Oops, sorry, underscore star. Then I should be able to see um, the arrows from all of the instances that's ever ran. And sometimes, sometimes you actually find one of these instances that just has an issue. Not all the time, but sometimes you might just be able to say, pinpoint one of the instances that has the issue. Then what do you do? Uh, and when I ask this question, usually people just tell me, uh, you restart the instance, you kill it, right? But what is wrong with that approach? So for example, if we do have one of these instances that has the issue, say uh, the first one, if I kill it, Kubernetes will automatically restart it for me, and maybe that solves the issue. But even if it does, we still don't know why that's happening, right? And here's something that you got to be careful, because if you just restart it, uh, if the same issue could happen again within you know, the next day or the next month. You just don't know. So what would be really interesting is to keep this instance up and running and troubleshoot it uh, before you terminate it. And in Kubernetes, we can do this uh, fairly easily by using something called labels. Because the way I set up my servers to serve, um, I am only serving instances that has the label code serving is equal to true. So what I can actually do dynamically is to change this label and set it to false so that this instance is no longer serving on the load balancer. And I can isolate this instance, and I can troubleshoot it. And the way I would do that is by you know, using the labels command. And I can go ahead and uh, let me see here, give it the, the label, uh, sorry, the name of the pod. So if I want to isolate this one instance, right, I can say uh, set my serving equal to false. Oh, it's uh, just label with no plural. Okay. 
And now if I go back, uh, I can see that I have one of these instances with the label set to false. And now this is isolated because of the way I set up my service, uh, we will no longer route traffic to it. But I also set it up in a way that I always need two instances serving. So even though I took one of these instances out of service, uh, Kubernetes automatically restarted another instance to take over for me. Now I have this isolated, then I can do a lot of things. For example, if I want to uh, you know, get into this container and see what's inside, what's running, right? In Docker, you have, we have Docker exec. In Kubernetes, we have kubectl exec, of course. And we can just give it the name of the instance we want to use. And I can get into bash, or you know, I can do a PS. And if I'm running a Java app, I can probably send like a dash three or some, or maybe it's this dash seven, where I can trigger uh, a thread dump. And then that will go into standard out, and I can pick it up from my aggregator login, uh, which is kind of neat. But in some cases, maybe maybe I wanted to see if this instance actually has an issue. Uh, maybe I want to attach a, a GMX agent to it. I want to see what's running inside, uh, maybe even a debugger of some sort, uh, in which case, what I can do is to um, to do something like uh, I can pull forward. So I can set up a pull forwarding from my local host, say uh, 9090, to the remote host that's running this particular instance, say 8080. And um, that will actually establish a secure tunnel uh, via TLS. And now I can actually go troubleshoot this particular instance and see if that actually has the issue. So for example, if I go to localhost 9090, uh, that will route me to that specific instance and that seems, seems to work, it works. Huh, interesting. But if I come back to here on this page, it still doesn't work. So you know, with some of these little uh, tricks we can, or tips, we can try to isolate the instance, we can figure out whether something is actually working or not. And if it is working, well, what we can do is to try to put it back into service or we can just optionally remove it, okay? Um, but sometimes that's not enough, right? After all that troubleshooting in the microservices world, you have potentially uh, services calling other services. You just need to know who's calling what. And if I go back to this little graph here in this visualization, uh, I can very clearly see in this graph, the UI is talking to guestbook service. Hmm. But do you actually trust this graph? How was this graph generated? Well, this is actually documentation. In the YAML file, in the descriptor of this deployment, I physically put in a little annotation that said that this app talks to that service. So in fact, this is not reflecting the real world scenario potentially because documentation could be outdated. So for example, uh, I don't know if this happened to you, but it happened to me in the past where I'm troubleshooting some uh, SOA deployment as a service-oriented architecture with multiple services. I'm following the documentation. I'm like going like three levels deep already. And then I finally arrived to this level where I realized, wait a second, um, whatever the documentation said, it's not there anymore. Uh, that is because documentation get outdated, right? So what you really want is potentially a, a way to reflect your current state uh, as much as possible in real time or near real time and not having to rely on just pure documentation. Uh, and for that, what we can do is, of, of course, um, there's a little demo of Weave earlier already. And, and with Weave, what's really nice is that this is actually a accurate reflection of all the networking connections that's happening in real time. So as you can see, somehow um, this, this connection just got dropped. So this line disappeared. But if I go back to my app, if I did a little refresh or something, um, eventually uh, this line will just come back, right? Because my app is talking to Zipkin. And that is quite nice too. What is Zipkin? It is a way, it's a tool that allows you to uh, gather uh, traces. You can actually send in for potentially a, a request ID or a trace ID that gets propagated across all of the the stack calls across all of the microservices calls, and all of these trace information, um, when the code started, when the code ended, how long did it take, and who talked to what, you can actually send all that information to Zipkin, and we can, and they can just aggregate this into a single view. 
uh, where you can see whether a, a, a call took all the way to the last level or did a call actually had an error uh, happening uh, in between. And we can do this too in Google Cloud. Uh, rather than running a Zipkin installation yourself, uh, you can actually propagate your trace information, for example, to Cloud Trace. And what that means is uh, if I go to the trace list here, uh -oh, let me do a refresh, sorry. Uh, if I find the trace, that's correlated to my request, maybe that one, yep. I should be able to see all the subsequent calls that got made, right? So my, my UI called the messaging service and subsequently it called the, uh, another service. And you can see how long that all took. And sometimes you actually see a little trace like this one that actually had an error. So with this real-time information or that actually reflects the real world, we can actually see potentially where this error occurred, and this error occurred, it seems like, in the Hello World service. But we still don't know why or how that got there. For the last five minutes, I'm just going to show you something that's really cool, because if we go back to the aggregated logging, if I go back to the log, um, right, and if I go back and see uh, what's in that log, right, like here we got the exception, and this log is not exactly useful. Uh, it's telling me there's a 404 arrow at the HTTP client, and I can kind of go to the, the the line of code on where this error occurred. But is there a time where you just wish you have more log? What do you usually do? What do people usually do? Well, in my past days, what I had to do was to, first of all, figure out which revision of the code is running in production. And if this is really, really an urgent issue, I need to check out that version. I need to add the log messages in there. I gotta push it out again um, and wait for that deployment to take place, right? That usually took a very long time. So it will be like a couple hours before I can even see additional log. And what if that log is not enough? Um, and what is really cool is that um, we actually have really awesome tooling on the Google Cloud platform. Uh, and you don't need to be running your application on Google Cloud to use this. This is actually usable even if you're running in another environment that is not on Google Cloud. And this is what we call debugging uh, capability. Uh, it's called stat driver debugging. So what I can actually do is for my running instance, I have installed a little uh, Java agent in this case. So I can go into this application instance. I can navigate into the source code, which I have in this case uploaded or I stored it on GitHub so Google can access it publicly. But if you have something proprietary, of course, uh, there are other ways for you to, uh, to do this, right? So let's assume we have the source, and I want to add a little debugging log here. I can actually go to my code. Let me zoom in a little bit, OK? And I can find the lines I want to debug. So for example, here, I want to add a log. So I'm going to say uh, the name is name. I want to see what is in the variable name, right? I can say, uh, this is how we do debug debugging, right? Number one, I'm here, right? And then you get uh, number two, uh, uh, I'm here now, right? So you can add these log messages as much as you want. And as soon as I click on add, this is propagated to all of the running instances that's attached to the agent, okay? So now if I go back and if I did a, another of these um, uh, requests, uh, what I should effectively do is for me to see this message in the logging console again. So if I go back to the logs, and if I scroll down a little bit, uh, let it catch up, and I should be able to see one of these messages. Ah, check this out. So I got number one, I'm here. Number two, the name is empty. Huh. So this is effectively a user error. This is a feature, not a bug. All right. No, but as you can see, we can actually troubleshoot some of these runtime environments fairly easily uh, with these type of debugging agent. And if I don't want the logs anymore, I can just get rid of it. And if you do want to keep the logs, right, you go back and check out the code, you add the, the right log message. You can, but we can do even more. If you ever want to see a real-time um, stack of what is happening in your application, what we can even do is to set up a snapshot. So what that means is rather than adding a debugger that will stop the world, right? What that means is the user wouldn't be able to get a response until somebody you know, on the other end steps through all the code. A 
with the stack driver debug, what we can do is we can add a snapshot. And whenever that a code came through here, we will capture the code stack, for example. And I can see the stack here of all the different um, uh, code layers. But what's even more impressive is I can actually see also the variable values in the scope. So I can very clearly see here in this call, the name parameter is in fact empty, right? And I can drill in into other uh, objects here as well. So that is a really, really easy way uh, to combine with your existing troubleshooting techniques uh, in addition to logs, to tracing, to figure out where which level had issues. Uh, you can actually get application level debugging capabilities uh, without actually adding uh, like overhead to your app. Okay, so that is pretty much all the time I have. Uh, I think um, just remember uh, there are a lot of toolings out there for you to to use. But uh, if you're interested, uh, feel free to check out the source code uh, that I have and um, learn more about SideDriver and other tools I found uh, useful uh, for this talk. So thank you very much for your time. Awesome, thank you. Um, we had an immediate question right at the beginning that you had um, a type of visualization tool that oh. was on um, localhost 8080 yeah. slash yeah. static. It was the one yeah. with all the different arrows and squares. Um, what is that? Yeah, that's funny. I always get, this, <laughs> get asked this question uh, all the time. Uh, it is actually a, a visualization tool that was originally uh, created by Brendan Burns, who was the, one of the original creators mm. of Kubernetes. I forked it to, for my demo as well, and oh. you can find it on uh, GitHub. So it is a just a, a little tool that I use for my demos, and it's really nice to visualize oh. uh, running in the cluster. So you can find it, uh, or I can send out the link later, but yeah. you can find it on my GitHub, um, Sound and Awesome. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, there was someone who was chatting with me. I'm not sure if it was in the context of this, but is there a okay. stack driver for Golang? Uh, yeah, so for debugging, we support uh, multiple languages, but mostly, well, there's Java, there's Go, but I never used it. Mm. Um, and Python, and uh, recently, uh, re very recently uh, announced uh, for Node.js as well. So I don't know if anyone here runs JavaScript on the back end, but I know, I know a lot of people use console.log <laughs> for debugging. Um, so we actually have a debugger that you can use, and you can get access to the same tooling here to debug your Node.js code. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, someone was asking for the link to the stack driver for Go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can share that uh, maybe on the Meetup group. And someone wrote console.log forever. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, we use system dot out, so <laughs> it's all. <okay. laughs> um, yeah, just so reminding people, hopefully you can find the chat box if you have further comments or questions as people are obviously pouring in. Um, and while you're doing that, I did have a quick question. I thought it was interesting what you mentioned earlier about maybe creating kind of a practice or culture of like killing um, your containers so quickly and not really troubleshooting to find out what went right. wrong because it's so easy now. And then you're saying, you know, the problem could come back in a week or a month or it could come back in two hours, right? And it could be right. pretty critical. Um, yeah. is, is that something you're really seeing out in the field that people just, oh, well, this this easy default and I've, I've got a million things on my list to do. So right yeah. now I'm actually not going to find out what the problem is. Oh, I definitely see it. In fact, um, I, I feel almost, well, this existed even before Kubernetes. Um, I've seen people bounce the servers even when their uh, Java uh, heap uh, goes out of memory. They just bounce it every week. Uh, I've seen people who now rely on Kubernetes uh, capabilities a lot more uh, and even more so, uh, don't try to find the root cause anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that I have seen people uh, with uh, you know JDBC connection issues, database connection issues, that wants to potentially automatically restart the application when there is connection issue. But when the, the real problem is actually in the connection pooling configuration rather than uh, you know needing to restart. So th there are definitely uh, this happening, I have seen. And um, you know I, I try not to you know, rely on the fact that Kubernetes restarts the application for you so much. Yeah. Um, you do have to find the root causes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and someone asked, do you have any place we can look further into using the labels for the services and ingress? Um, yeah, so I think the Kubernetes documentation is number one. Um, I can share a slide potentially, but I think the documentation should cover uh, many of these. Uh, one of the, I, I think the, the way that the that Kubernetes exposes some of these services by default, if you use a command line to just say kubectl run and kubectl expose, uh, you don't really get to play with the labels, but if, even though that's probably the, one of the, the most powerful features of Kubernetes. Uh, but once you started to uh, get deeper into you know, creating the YAML files and start using the labels, then uh, you can really use it to your advantage. Like in this case, you can use label to uh, figure out when not to serve some instances just by the label. Or you can use it for blue-green deployment. Uh, you can use it for canary. There's just so many things you can use for labels. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are all the questions. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm not sure if you're planning to stick around, but um, if not, <laughs> we'll say thanks for coming. And if you are going to stick around, then um, we will yeah. transfer over to Carlos now. Oh, and I should mention, um, if you weren't here at the beginning, uh, yes. So. Ray is going to be here for Java 1, if any of you are Java 1 people. <laughs> um, we'll be there as well. Actually, Weaveworks will be running um, a microservices birds of a feather and a Kubernetes birds of a feather back to back in the same room on, um, on Monday. So if any of you are Java people, then hopefully we'll see you there. Um, all right. So thank all you right. so much again. Thanks for the great talk. Thank Thanks for having me here. Yes. Cheers. Um, and Carlos, does your camera work? Camera and video, can you guys see me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Carlos. Is, is this thing working? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, nice. <laughs> and, and a note from someone to Java people, no one is perfect. It's true. Java will never go away. <laughs> um, so if, um, if any of you here were a little bit late, we have Carlos here, who's from Container Solutions. And um, he's a bit of an extension of our developer experience team. It's been really a pleasure to work together um, on different projects. And so now he'll be talking about monitoring your microservices based on some work that he did with us. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks also, Ray, for your talk. I really, really enjoyed it. I had, an, uh, I had no idea about Stackdriver, and I'm really, really going to take a look at it. Uh, so yeah, uh, for, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Carlos Leon. I work uh, as a um, software engineer at Container Solutions, and we are helping uh, with Cloud with uh, the integration of their products, with the extension of them, and from the, all the things that we do lately, I had a chance to work with, uh, with monitoring with the, with their uh, monitoring uh, offering uh, in with cloud, and and it was a, a really interesting experience because uh, after talking about it with uh, with some of our clients as well, we realized or I realized that not not everyone had a, a real understanding of what monitoring is uh, and what the difference, and people also confused monitoring with logging. So I want to go through that first, uh, just to just to explain what the difference is, and then hopefully we can get a better sense of, of what what the whole thing and what the purpose of it is. Uh, so we're going to be talking then about that monitor microservices, but this uh, these concepts do not apply only to microservices. You can also extend this back to your uh, big monolithic application if you still have those lying around, which I'm pretty sure that some of you might. Uh, no shame in that. Uh, and so if your application, if you have an application that has been deployed to production and is now being released into the wild, how do you, how do you uh, understand how your application is behaving in production if you're not really listening to it, right? So for this, there's many, many ways to do that. Uh, but there is a common understanding now in the field to talk about the red method. And basically what it proposes is for you to gather the rate of your application, right? So the number of requests per second that your services are perceiving, the error rate, so the number of failed requests contrasted to the rate that you currently have and the duration of each of the requests. And the idea behind this is that you can tell early on 
uh, in, in the process, uh, how your application is uh, actually behaving right now. So under actual production traffic, how is your application doing? Because when you run your tests locally, your application might work just fine. But once you release it into the wild with a real user load and with uh, latency between your servers and the database servers and the cache servers and all this stuff, uh, it might be that your application is not as fast as you would have thought. But if you're not listening to your application, then you won't be able to hear. Uh, uh, with that being said, I, I, I would like to, to check if everyone can hear me well at this point. And because uh, uh, I was, uh, we were having connection issues before, but I hope that now uh, everything is coming smoothly. Yep, I can hear you. There are a few uh, micro, micro delays, but they're very small. Awesome, great. So let's keep going. So uh, with the red method in our pocket, then it's really, really hard to. Um, it is still really hard to understand where to where to start poking your application, right? And we thought, well, maybe if you already have an infrastructure in place, which you probably do if your application is already running, you already have an application, you already have an infrastructure. Well, then maybe you should start with your infrastructure because it's cheaper to extend or to poke around your infrastructure than to extend your application, right? Because your application goes through a development cycle. And if you need to modify the code to get metrics from it, then it's going to be rather, uh, it's going to be more complicated, right? Normally the infrastructure tends to be a little more flexible in that sense when we're talking about the microservices context. So we decided to go for uh, Kubernetes, just as uh, Ray is also doing that. Um, we think that uh, today uh, a good infrastructure for running your containers payload is Kubernetes, although there is better uh, other really good offerings in the market. But for the sake of this demo, we decided to go for Kubernetes. And we thought, OK, uh, what are the standard metrics that we can gather from our infrastructure? And so you have memory, you have CPU, storage, and network uh, throughput. Uh, and Kubernetes already has these metrics built in. This means that when you set up your Kubernetes cluster, or when you create a new Kubernetes cluster in a cloud provider, by default, out of the box, all these metrics are there for you to just consume. So once you get a hold of these metrics at a certain point in time, where do you store them? Well, you can store them in your local machines or you can store them in the cloud, of course. And this is where Weave Monitor comes in. Uh, Weave Monitor is a hosted scalable dropping solution for your uh, for your infrastructure and what it does, it sits in your infrastructure and it's going to gather these metrics automatically for you from Kubernetes and it's gonna store it in the cloud for you to later on query it. So to get started, we're gonna set up uh, with probes in Kubernetes. Then we're gonna deploy something called the suck shop. Optionally, we're gonna deploy Grafana and configure Grafana to consume the metrics. Um, and because today I'm not feeling lucky. I decided to run the demo beforehand. I'm really, really sorry about that, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to risk it. And I just made a couple of screenshots and this is what we're going to go through. So we set up with in Kubernetes. Uh, it's quite straightforward. You can sign up for a free account and, and you can uh, set it up in your Kubernetes cluster whenever you want, as many times as you want. And you can just uh, drop uh, projects, create new ones, add your colleagues, share your projects with uh, your colleagues and all this. And it just works uh, right out of the box. So we're going to go and set up a Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. We already have that set up in Google, Google Cloud. Sorry. Oh, and I was just then, checking to see. Are you sharing a screen? Um, yes. Am I? It sounded like you were talking to uh, something that you were showing, but we're just looking at your face. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, no. I've been. Oh, I I'm thought sorry. I was sharing my oh, screen for ages. No, no, no. Okay. It's, it's fine. Um, ooh, it's great. Okay. Let's see. Share screen, of course. Here we go. Okay. So I'm really sorry about that. Can you guys now see my screen? Yep. All right. So 
Okay, so let's start again. Welcome, my name is Carlos. <laughs> Kidding. So we talked about the red method and we're checking the rates, the errors and the durations, right? Where to start, Kubernetes built in, we're gonna be gathering information about memory, CPU, storage and network throughput. Um, with monitor, so this is what we're gonna go through today. Set up with the with probes, deploy the, so the shop, deploy Grafana and configure it to gather the metrics. Uh, so once we've uh, once we have set up our Kubernetes cluster, we're now going to deploy our weave probes into our cluster. And the instructions are given to you, and you can just uh, copy paste. There's a couple of fields that you need to replace, and that'll be pretty much it. And then once you uh, the probes have been set up in your cluster, then you can go ahead to the monitor section of weave cloud. And as you can see, uh, I'm gathering here something called the node resources notebook. It is a uh, pre-built uh, notebook or a dashboard, if you want to call it like that, um, by Weave. And so this is it's got standard queries to gather information from your um, cluster. So here we can see, for example, Kubernetes this is a little bit of a more crazy notebook and it, is a, it might be a little bit daunting but uh, once you understand what kubernetes is exposing it's easier to read so what we're doing here now is just getting the the amount of cpu that each of our pods in our cluster are consuming the pods that are related to kubernetes uh, so i'm talking again about the metrics that you want to expose in your application because the idea is now that you're conscious that you need to listen to your to your application well you also need to have your application to tell you what you want to hear. And so what we really want to hear, again, is the red method, which is the array, the error, and the duration of the, of the requests. And the industry standard endpoint for your application to expose metrics is, surprise, surprise, slash metrics. So any application that exposes some sort of metrics it should do in this uh, endpoint. And uh, Prometheus has become more or less the industry standard for, um, for integrating uh, into your application and exposing metrics. So Prometheus is a time series database which will uh, store your metrics. It will query your application every certain amount of time. Uh, by default, I think it's 20 or 30 seconds, but you can tweak that. And so every this amount of time, it'll go to your application to the slash metrics endpoint, and it will gather all the metrics. It will store it, and later on, you can query the data and you can graph it out. So I just just like we did with uh, Kubernetes. So what we've what the Weave Pro is is doing in your infrastructure is to query Kubernetes every certain amount of time, every five or fifteen seconds is going to query Kubernetes for, um, for the slash metrics endpoint. It will gather the data, it will store it. And then what we're doing here in Monitor, in with Monitor, is simply to query Prometheus using a language called PromQL to gather those metrics. And then automatically we get all these graphics for free. So with that being said, Prometheus has client libraries to expose automatically metrics in your systems. So there is Go, Python, Ruby, Java, um, Lua, and many more. You, get, you can go later to the Prometheus website and you can see all the supported uh, clients for exposing your metrics. And I've taken the liberty to open one of the example applications. Uh, this is all open source and you guys can check it out. Uh, and for example, for our Go application, for those of you who speak Go, you can see that in the main function, uh, we are registering the slash metrics endpoint. And basically we're calling some sort of handler given by the Prometheus uh, client library. And what this is gonna do is that every time that the user goes, that uh, a request comes to slash metrics, Prometheus is going to render uh, certain metrics from your application, which gathers automatically, it hooks up with your application's code. Uh, 
and it will gather all the request latency and the request per second, the errors and all this, and then you will be able to query that later on. The same goes for Java. If you speak Java, you can see that we're creating, that we're hooking up the slash metrics endpoint, and then we're passing some sort of a handler, which uh, by default is returning the Prometheus libraries handler. And one last example is the Ruby one. We are using Rack, and we're simply mounting this middleware, the collector one and the exporter one, and these are going to hook up automatically to the slash metrics endpoint, and they will expose metrics about your application. All right, moving on. Uh, the application that we are going to use for this example is called the Sock Shop. Um, and what we did here was to build a reference microservices application. This application is basically a shop, a web shop, where you can come and buy socks. You have a catalog, you have a shopping cart, users, you can place your order. There is shipping, there is a, um, a queue processor in the back end that is going to ship uh, your orders and all this stuff. And the application is a polyglot application, so it speaks Java, it speaks Go, it speaks Node.js, right? And also the deployment scripts are written in Bash. So there is a bunch of technologies involved. He also uses RabbitMQ, MongoDB, and whatnot. And all the microservices are integrating with the Prometheus client libraries. So every single microservice exposes a slash metrics endpoint. And then every certain amount of time, the weave probe in our Kubernetes infrastructure is querying automatically all these services and is gathering the metrics and then is storing the metrics in the cloud. You could achieve the same effect with just deploying a local instance of Prometheus, it's just that you would have to do a lot more of manual work. So the weave probe finds automatically all the services that are running in your infrastructure and it will try to find this standard metrics endpoint. And so, yes, the Suck Shop is written with Go, Java, and Node.js. And then, yeah, what we want to get is uh, the rate, the errors, and the durations for our metrics so that at any point in time, we can see how our application is behaving. So once uh, we deploy the Suck Shop to our uh, infrastructure, to Kubernetes in this case, then we can query, for example, the request duration uh, for all of the services uh, in buckets of uh, one minute. And then we can see here, these are the different services. You can really see the names here right now. You have to hover over them, but um, this is a screenshot. So you can imagine that this one of this is the user's uh, microservice. The other one is the front end. The other one might be the shopping cart microservice. The other one could be the shipping processor, and the other one could be whatever other microservice it might be. But the idea is that you have a standard uh, notebook or a standard dashboard where you can come and see how your application right now is behaving. Are the requests taking too long? Are we perceiving any sort of spike? And if we did, why did we? The latency at the, of the application increased at 9 p.m., was there anything specific that happened at that time? Was there a deployment? Was there a schedule maintenance? What was going on at that point? And so with this information, then we can better understand what our application is actually trying to tell us, right? In this point, for example, we see this is for the 200 uh, status requests. And the second graphic is for the 400 and the 500 errors. And we could see that at some point there was a spike in this point. Now, uh, if from this dashboard, we're missing the context of what happened exactly at this point. We can't really tell without the context. So we would need a, a yet another metric to tell what happened around uh, the application's infrastructure at this point. But because I'm the one that did the, de the deployment, I know what happened. I have the context. And basically what happened here is I released the application basically. And so at that point, um, the, the, the metrics was trying to gather uh, one of the applications and the application was not yet up. So there were a bunch of 400s or 500s, I don't know. 
Uh, but at one, once the application became 100% available, then you can see how it drops and now it's back to normal. Uh, another thing that people uh, kept on asking us is that um, they wanted to bring their own dashboard or what they said is that they wanted to use something like Grafana. Um, Grafana, for, for those of you who don't know, is a graphing tool. It's a web application. It's just a front end where you can connect to multiple backends that store certain data metrics, especially, and then you can graph that out or you can create beautiful charts with Grafana connecting to these different backends with little effort. And the good news is that using WaveCloud, you can because WaveCloud in the behind the scenes is exposing a Prometheus API compatible backend. So you can talk to WaveCloud as if it was Prometheus. So there is a driver for Grafana to talk to Prometheus and that's what we do. We hook up Grafana with WaveCloud and then we can get something like this. In here, I created a dashboard that is uh, showing me the current uh, status of my Kubernetes um, infrastructure. You can see that it's uh, much more user-friendly at this point to graph it out in Grafana to see the Kubernetes pod resources, for example. And it can tell me what the memory and CPU and file system usage is and the amount of cores that I have and what is the network throughput and all this kind of stuff. And for the users, uh, for the uh, stock shop infra uh, application, sorry, I can have a dashboard with all the queries per second for each of the microservices and the latency. And this is something that you want to have because if your job is to keep an eye on the application and make sure that it's working properly, this can help you to debug issues real quick. Because if the application, for example, um, Ray was saying, okay, your application is failing, but which pod is it failing on? If you don't have uh, the tools to get to this information fast, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time and it's going to create you, create you a lot of stress. If you have a, something that can tell you that an error that you perceived was just, was just a glitch, then you can let it go. But if it is something that you can notice that you can verify that has a pattern that happens every now and then, then you can go and dig deeper. But if you don't have the tools to look for this, then you're going to miss a lot out. So the, your application is going to try to tell something, but you're not going to be listening. And when we say this, this is what we mean, to have the means to listen to your application. So again, um, WebCloud is the probe of Weave that has been deployed to your infrastructure is pulling metrics from your application every now and then. Every, every amount of seconds it goes to your application to the slash metrics to each one of them and it stores the data. And later on you can come to, for example, Grafana now and you can create metrics. You talk to that backend and then you say, okay, I want the metrics for my cart application and I want to see the queries per second. And later, you can also say, okay, now I want to see the card latency. So I would like to see, for example, what is the 99th uh, quantile or the 50th percent uh, quantile. And what is the mean? What is the average of the request duration for my application? And you can see that maybe at some point you had a spike, but it was just the one, the one user that got unlucky and had just that. If you are familiar with APM applications, then this is not, not, not news for you. And if you have never tried this before, I really encourage you to do so. It's very, very easy to integrate, uh, especially for the Go library, for the Ruby library, and for the Java libraries, which are the officially supported ones. There is plenty of examples for you to, to integrate to your application, and then you can get a better understanding of what metrics are. Uh, here are some links for you guys to visit later on. I'm gonna share these uh, slides on the Meetup page. Uh, any of you don't have any other questions, uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carlos. That was fantastic. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, we do have a question. Um, what was the library to integrate into the application again? So the library is Prometheus, which is also a time series database. So Prometheus will store your metrics but your application needs to expose them. You can write this by yourself or you can 
or you can use one of the Prometheus client libraries, which is what everybody is doing nowadays, even Kubernetes. Like if you go to the Kubernetes core uh, code, you will see that there is the Prometheus client integrated in the Kubernetes core exposing metrics. Excellent. Somebody asked about alerts, and this is a great question. Thank you, Vlad Panchienko. Uh, so this, um, this is a hot topic because, of course, once you have the metrics for your application, you can then come up with really crazy stuff like, what if uh, my latency starts building up and building up and building up and building up? At some point, once you pass a certain threshold, you want to be notified about this. And this is where alerts kick in. Uh, Prometheus offers uh, a built-in functionality to alert you if some of this stuff happens. And this is 100% configurable. You can set it for any of your services. And there is different gateways. So say, for example, to take an example, if my front-end application's latency uh, starts building up and at some point reaches, say, 500 milliseconds render time, I can then trigger an alert and then Prometheus will pick that up and then it can uh, notify me over different channels. So there is chat ops, there is pager duty, there is, I think there is also Slack, email, and a bunch of other stuff. So in this way, you can have uh, alerting. There's a, there's a really good talk by my colleague, Jason uh, Smith. He, he, he goes into deeper detail into the uh, alerts with uh, Prometheus. Oh, and also in with cloud, also you you can you can set up alerts as well. You just right there, you can verify using your PromQL language. And you make the same queries and just add a couple of conditionals to see where you want where you want to set the limit or the threshold, and then you can set up the different alerting channels and get notified about that. Awesome. Well, thank you. And with that, we are out of time. Hopefully you can see my final slide. If you haven't joined the Weave user group yet, please uh, see our meetup page. And if you need any help or want to chat with us, the developer experience team here at Weaveworks is always on our Slack channel. So that link will help you invite yourself. So thank you so much again for joining. Thank you to Ray. Thank you to Carlos for a great session. And uh, I'll see you guys again and see everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.